as an example, because I'm the largest shareholder of Sprott, one would expect that as the gold price increases, the assets under management at Sprott would increase and the management fees was, at Sprott would increase. And probably the, po the popularity of Sprott uh, in an increasing gold price environment would increase. So I would benefit from an increase in, gold in, in the gold price, whether or not I owned gold. But I own gold as an insurance asset. It helps me sleep nights and stay calm. And at 71 years old, one years of age, sleep is a very nice thing. I don't own gold because I think it might go from $2,400 to $2,700. I own gold because I'm afraid it'll go to nine or $10,000. Uh, somebody who has less fear than me probably wants to own a little less. Again, legendary investor Rick Rule has made a compelling case for holding gold, not for incremental gains, but as a hedge against a potential dramatic surge in its price. Speaking on Liberty and Finance, Rule revealed his apprehension that gold could soar to $9,000 or even $10,000 per ounce. This fear, rather than the prospect of modest gains, underpins his substantial investment in the precious metal. Rules suggest that investors with less fear of economic instability might choose to hold less gold. Turning his attention to silver, Rule articulated a bullish outlook, noting that silver often follows gold's lead, particularly in the latter stages of a bull market. Drawing on historical precedents, he pointed to past dramatic increases in silver prices during the 1970s and early 2000s. He downplayed the significance of minor price movements, stressing the potential for substantial long-term gains. According to Rule, while many silver investors focus on modest increases, the real opportunity lies in the potential for a tenfold rise. Rule also expressed skepticism about the adoption of gold-backed currencies, arguing that such a move is highly unlikely. Politicians, he asserts, are reluctant to impose the fiscal discipline required by a gold standard as it limits their ability to maneuver economically and maintain power. He highlighted the inconsistency between the political drive for control and the constraints that a gold-backed currency would impose. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview, but first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our recaps. Enjoy the episode. It goes higher. And my experience has been that when gold establishes the momentum in precious metals, and then the generalist investor comes in, that the generalist investor is, is uh, encouraged by the momentum in gold uh, and buys the asset with lower unit costs and more volatility, which is to say silver. Uh, this usually occurs about midway through a bull market. No, no reason why history has to repeat itself there. But when silver assumes leadership from gold, it moves further and it moves faster. I know that the gentleman would like me to give him a date. I'm too old and smart for that. Uh, I would just suggest to him that we're in the early innings of a precious metals bull market, uh, and he needs to be patient for gold to establish a dominant trend before silver really gives fireworks to the upside. It's worth waiting for, by the way, Dunnigan. Uh, your younger audience won't be familiar with the dynamics of a silver bull market. The first one, of course, that I... Uh, lived through was the 1970s where silver went from about a buck to 50 bucks that's not representative i think uh, a, a better market to pay attention to was uh the uh, early 2000s market from about five dollars to about fifty dollars a, a tenfold move in silver too many silver bugs these days these days have low expectations high expectations in terms of of, of time but low expectation in terms of dimension. I read all kinds of stuff uh, on the internet about the fact that silver might go to $35. But I could care less about a $5 move in silver. Uh, I've experienced a couple tenfold moves and one fifty-fold move. So a $5 move uh, is of no particular interest to me. Uh, of a gold-backed currency is nil. Uh, a gold-backed currency imposes discipline on politicians with regards to their uh, fiscal measures, uh, and politicians live for power, not constraints. So I think the probability that you see a gold-backed currency anywhere in the world, with the possible ex exception of Liechtenstein, is nil. Um, if you look at the amount of gold in Fort Knox, 
and, and you look at the amount of circulation of money in circulation in the United States, uh, you would need a gold price that was almost unfathomable to current holders uh, to back the currency. But as I say, this is a fantasy. Uh, people who subject themselves to the indignity of being politicians are people with an unquenchable thirst for power. And uh, a gold-backed currency would impose a discipline on them, which is unthinkable to them, of copper production. Uh, and so the amount of revenue available <clears throat> from a silver stream rather, relative to copper production means that it's not in the company's interest to do that. In fact, what tends to happen is sort of the other way around, albeit not involving governments. What, gen what often happens is a copper producer with byproduct silver pre-sells the silver production to a streamer uh, in, in return for a disproportionate share of the capital cost of putting the mine in production. The governments are much more inclined to steal than to trade. So what I think you'll see in the case of the copper business is de facto nationalization. Rather than stealing the mine out, uh, outright, you will see them uh, increase the requirement for offsite capital contributions like building schools, roads, and water systems, increasing taxation, increasing duties, and increasing royalties. Uh, stealing the output very much like the U.S. government stole the oil and gas industry's output with excess profits taxes. In today's news recap, alarm and amusement at Biden's performance as world reacts to debate with Trump. Thursday night's presidential debate was watched around the world by allies anxious about their future U.S. ties, as well as autocratic governments seeking to rival the U.S.-led global order. The two candidates have distinctly different ideas about how to tackle the challenges of a world consumed by multiple wars, rising geopolitical tensions and doubts over America's commitment to its longtime partners. That contrast was occasionally on show Thursday night, but it was Biden's performance that dominated headlines. Personal attacks, hazy memory, mocking each other. This debate was very entertaining for many Chinese people, Hu Shijin, a nationalist Chinese commentator, said in a post on X. The prospect of Trump returning to the White House is alarming for many U.S. allies in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere, their ties with Washington having often been strained during his presidency. Biden's debate performance is prompting British diplomats to prepare more urgently for the prospect of dealing with Trump again in the White House, the former official said. Now we'll show you the best clips, but first smash the subscribe button, hit the like button, and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. Enjoy the show. Because it doesn't take into account utility. Uh, prices move really as a function of utility. Silver has two utilities. One, which is highly speculative as a medium of exchange and a store of value, which is to say its, its investment characteristics. The other is its industrial utility, uh, its use as a germicide, uh, and its use as a reflectant uh, in solar applications. Uh, so while I understand the first part of the, the question, uh, I think the attention that silver adherents pay to the 16 to 1 relationship between the relative abundance of gold and silver in the Earth's, in the Earth's pardon me, crust is probably less important than the social roles that they both played uh, in terms of investment demand or the industrial roles that they both enjoy. That the market share of all precious metals related investments, including physical precious metals, precious metals equities and precious metals, public precious metals debt, comprises less than one half of 1% of the value of all savings and investment assets in the United States. Uh, that's important, uh, first of all, because the number is so small. But secondly, too, because the four-decade mean market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets was 2%. So if you had reversion to mean, which I believe you will, uh, that means that de uh, the demand for this asset class grows fourfold in the largest savings and investment market in the world. Uh, I think that, that that's a broad enough asset class and a, a broad enough competitive um, universe that reversion to mean is an important statistical tool. To the extent that you want to use reversion to mean in something more volatile or more constrained, uh, seems to me problematic to be dumber than they are.
that they have no chance of catching us with regards to mining policy. Um, political risk is a given, unfortunately. In mining, your assets are fixed. Uh, if the questioner and I owned a freighter and, and one port became unfriendly, we'd sail out of the port and never go back there. <laughs> unfortunately, a mine in Western Australia is in Western Australia. Even worse, a mine in California is in California. You must assume the worst and hope for the best. Uh, what I try to do is benchmark jurisdictions in terms of their current larceny and greed uh, and in terms of what other sources of revenue are available to them more easily. But mercifully, in Australia, you have, a, a first of all, an economy that's unusually dependent on extractive industries. So there's only a certain level of stupidity that the government can afford. The mining industry is irrelevant in the United States, so the level of stupidity that we can afford here is much greater. Secondly, the sophistication of the Australian citizenry with regards to mining, whether they're employers, or pardon me, employees or relatives of employees in Australia is much higher, so that the electorate is more likely to spot stupidity in Australia than the U.S. electorate, who unfortunately would often be challenged to spell the word mine. What do you think of Rick Rule's take? Do you agree with him? Will gold and silver rise further this year, or are we on the high of the year already? Post in the comments section your honest opinion and watch this video right here because you'll love it. I see you on the other side.